is the first speaker, and then um, after the talk uh, is completed, I'll go on to the uh, the other um, speakers. Um, Dr. Oh, sorry, rather, sorry, they have Mr. <laughs> down here. <laughs> 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 Professor Richard Sinnott, <laughs> um, uh, who's presenting um, uh, classifying data sharing models for e-health collaborations. Now, um, I actually know um, Richard from um, the UK, so apologies there for calling you Mr. Um, I've before. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> going down. <laughs> It's payback. <laughs> um, so Professor Sinnott um, was director of um, the um, technical director of the National e Science Centre at the University of, of Glasgow. He was also deputy director of the Bioinformatics uh, Research Centre, also in Glasgow, and the technical director of the National e Science, uh, uh, sorry, the National Centre for e Social Science. All all centres that came out of the Big e Science program in the UK. Um, uh, currently, um, Richard is Director of E-Research at the University of Melbourne, and um, he's also the technical architect of the ORIN project, a 20 million, um, is it an ANQUIS project, yeah, uh, on Australian urban research. Um, and he has been involved in extensive portfolio of e-science projects, um, particularly in the health area. And so I think this will be a very um, interesting uh, presentation from Richard because he's done some very um, uh, proactive work in the community um, and looking forward to his talk. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so I probably have too many slides to talk through in any, any great detail. So as Anne mentioned, I'm the Director of E-Research at the U University of Melbourne. I've been involved in E since there was E, I guess the word you could probably describe it as. And what I'm going to talk about today is the sort of lessons I've learned in building e infrastructures, research infrastructures for health, uh, health researchers, effectively. Um, I've been involved in lots of stuff for a, a, a long time now. Um, I was, most of the projects I've been involved in have, have had direct sort of requirements on security, data access, usage linkage, reusage of, of data sets, et cetera, et cetera. So I've tended to specialize in those domains where the finer grained access control is essential. And I guess in building the kind of the vision of what can be done with security and the practical translation of that into big organizations like the, the National Health Service in the UK, you learn a lot about what, what you might be able to do with a, a research prototype, but we'll never um, see the light of day in the real world of big organizations with big responsibilities on protecting access to and usage of data. So what I'm going to talk about in the next 18 minutes, if I stop rambling on, is lessons I've learned in building these kinds of systems. I'll focus on three in, 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 in particular, which one of them is um, looking at cardiovascular functional genomics, so genetic causes of high blood pressure. One of them was, or is, looking at um, low blood pressure. Yeah. prediction of um, hyper, hyper, hypotension in brain trauma patients. And then another project I'm involved in, which is uh, currently ongoing, which is a, a European project, which is a five-year project looking at adrenal cancer and different types of adrenal tumors. Um, and the lessons I learned in, in, in building these that kind of IT systems, because I guess at the, at the end, my main conclusion I'll tell you now is there is no IT system that works en masse. There are a collection of scenarios and a collection of technologies which you apply them in the right way and you get the right stakeholders on board, you can be made to work. But coming along with, I know how to build X, will never get you anywhere in, in this world, especially. So what do I do? I mean, I, I, e, e means many things to many people. From my perspective, it's, it's, I tend to work in domains where there's multiple researchers sharing data or information across multiple organizations. A lot of the time it's to do with secure access to and usage of data, which is only for certain people or for a given length of time, what have you. Very rarely I'm asked to build supercomputer sort of applications, make them run you know, on NCI or Nectar Cloud or whatever. But by and large, that's not really my daily bread and butter. Most people I deal with are wrestling with data and access to and sharing of data. Um, and especially in the clinical world, you never get anywhere without information governance, ethics, policy, a whole gamut of showstoppers basically trying to stop you from 
doing as an IT person what you'd like to do. You think your technology can do the sort of things that the researchers want, but there are these various hurdles, obstacles, call it you want, which are in your way, which you have, you can't just pay lip service to them. You really have to do, take these full on and, and make them, um, overcome them basically. And a lot of this is trust. Trusting me as an individual to build these kind of IT systems, trusting the technologies themselves, are they robust enough? Well, we're never going to open our firewall, irrespective of how clever you claim your security crypto stuff is. It ain't going to happen. So how can you work around these kinds of decisions, especially when we speak a language as IT people, which means nothing to major organizations that we work with. The fact that they wouldn't know what a grid certificate or an X509 or a PDP or a PEP or any of the other vocabulary we throw at them. Um, and yet, fundamentally, they sit on a lot of the data that researchers are trying to get access to. And it all comes down to liability. If it goes horribly wrong, who do they blame? Who do they sue for a billion? And this is really one of the major challenges in building IT systems in this context. So I'll just speed through a little bit of this. So there are different ways you can do it. You can take the, the NHS, Connecting for Health. We're going to solve all IT problems across all uh, care providers and fail dismally, which they probably have now, I guess you could say. I don't do that. I try to fault solve certain problems for certain researchers who are trying to access and share certain data. So it's very targeted what I do. It's not trying to solve many, people, many problems for many people. It's very solving problems for specific kinds of people who are trying to share specific kinds of data. And there are, if I just step through some of these, uh, there are a range of solutions you can come up with. Uh, if I just briefly go. So the simplest one, which is you know, ideally, you'd be able to log into a system and say, show me all the people with type 2 diabetes. And it talks to 25 separate databases across Australia and brings all the data in and they, there you go. That's distributed querying, distributed processing can be done, but I'll talk about doing it doesn't always make it, make, um, deliver what you want to, uh, fundamentally. Second one is to ignore all the existing data sets, set up a brand new database which captures all the kind of information that these people are trying to share, but they all have heterogeneous data room formats, etc. A third one is to have simple, lightweight applications sitting inside of their hospitals or in their labs or wherever it might be, feeding data out. So we're not trying to punch through the firewall and give me a data. It's actually just pushing data out to the wider world. There are a collection of other ones as well, which I probably won't give in the time. But I think we, we've built systems previously where you can generate queries which are periodically pulled into a clinical organization. They'll have a committee meeting on a Wednesday afternoon, say, do we like this person? Do we allow this to happen or not? And if the answer is yes, then they'll run a query or generate the data, and then that can be f fed out to the wider world. But there's a variety of these kinds of scenarios. And I guess the, the, the simplest way is just to take you through some of them. Um, this was the very first project I inherited, so I'm a slightly sarcastic with it. But just two minutes ago, she said, some of your slides are going to be years old. This, she was right. This is from 2005, so I've been around that long. So this project was all about supporting researchers who do um, well, cardiovascular functional genomics. Basically, they, they bred rats and mice to be hypertensive, have high blood pressure, and then they'd run their experiments, micro-experiments, to try and work out which genes are causing this, effectively. And they'd use Google and they bounce around all the big genome databases, all PubMed, Medline, all these kinds of resources that are out there to do their research. They do their own uh, data mining in a manual process. We said, oh, we'll do a better job than that. We'll bring all the data to you. They had a, a whole range of databases that they were interested in, that they'd like access to. And we said, we'll build you an interface where you can get all this data in one go. So we did. And this is the front end to it. So you type of the name of the thing you're looking for. So I'm looking for all the publications or all the information you have about the PAC-7 gene, which was one of the things they were interested in at the time. And we'll pull back all the information from all these different data resources that are out there. The position of that gene on the chromosome, the protein sequence, who's published papers that have already identified this gene as being involved in hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. And we allowed them to personalize it and do all those sort of things they wanted to do. It worked. We delivered it. The community hated it. In fact, they didn't hate it, they just didn't touch it. They were paranoid of each other because we, we were building an infrastructure for, to allow researchers to share the data. And fundamentally, they didn't want to share. I mean, they were really paranoid of each other. The people who will be understand which gene is causing hypertension is your competitor. I mean, that's a, a really a, a classic sort of one liner is they'd rather share their toothbrush than their data. And this was a, a community where that absolutely was the case. So they didn't really want to share. They, they liked having the grant money to do what they wanted to do as business as usual, but fundamentally there was an issue with building a technology which allows you to connect data and data resources. And there were a whole range of things associated with this project. 
And fundamentally, the main issue, and looking back now at the time, it was kind of frustrating, but it's because we didn't get our security story right effectively. We said, we'll connect all these resources, you'll be able to share all your data, and it will all be wonderful when you all, you know, cure heart attacks of the future. The fact of the matter is, they didn't want to. Well, they did in their own, but they wanted to be the ones who did it, I guess. So that's one. So in a, in, a, in a nutshell, can we build an infrastructure where I can say, hit a button and say, give me all the data and bring all the data in? They, there you go. Yes, you can. <clears throat> and number two, which is probably the simplest and the best one, which I push it as hard as I can these days, is building an independent database for researchers to collaborate and coordinate their efforts. Um, I'm involved in probably half a dozen projects doing these things now. And in a nutshell, the basic model is you have clinicians and doctors and oncologists and radiologists and all the people who work in a hospital in the first line of care for patients who get sick and have diseases and stuff. And then you have all the wider world out there who are trying to get access to data sets and samples to understand which genes are involved in causing that person to be particularly have that, um, cancer or whatever it might be. And so what we, this model really is, is a matchmaking service for researchers, clinicians to firstly say, I've got a patient with an X. And the researchers to say, can I have a sample, please? Can I have this? And that sounds really trivial and naive, but when the sort of information that we have to collect is so very specific to those patients with those certain types of conditions that it doesn't exist in any hospital system right now. Uh, or rather, it doesn't, yes, I mean, it exists on many, many systems, but in many, many formats and, uh, um, and distributed databases, even inside of a hospital. So just to give you an example of what this looks like when you build it, this is a project that started this year. So this is looking at adrenal tumors. Your adrenal glands are just by your kidneys. Like, as I say, the more of these things I do, the more clinical I become. So there are a range of different types of tumor, which all have a fairly negative prognosis if you get them. Um, so there's pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas and all this kind of stuff. And there are researchers who are trying to understand what's the best way to treat patients with these tumor types, basically. That's it. And what we've been tasked with doing in this project is to build the glue, the IT system which allows the clinicians who, who deal with these patients and all the wider researchers who do imaging analysis or who do omics flavor X or Y or Z to get access to samples and track the patients and, and there are a whole range of fairly large clinical trials involving, well, each one of the, the trials has got a couple of thousand people in each, basically. <clears throat> and fundamentally, it's about to support the collaboration. That's what my job in this project is. So this project started this year. You can see all of that. So that's the sort of, um, we have all of these databases established now, which are fairly extensive in terms of the sort of data points, the information that is needed to be collected on the patients themselves. There are 11,000, this was a couple of days ago, annotations for every patient. So this is, they've had chemotherapy, they've had drug X, they've had, they responded to drug Y and the clinic, clinicians made an observation of them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you want to then log into our system and say, show me all the men between 40 to 50 who have this type of tumor, then we have that information. So then you can then say, the researchers themselves, for a variety of reasons, can't share this data with everybody. They can only share it within Germany. Or in fact, they're kind of paranoid. They only want it for people in their own clinic uh, who can have access to it. So we set up systems to, do, to provide this sort of layered security system whereby researchers can share at the level they want. Fundamentally, they're not obliged to give anything away. And as you see there, the only identifying information we have is the contact detail for the clinician who's responsible. So the fact you can say, for your patient, um, Germany, Berlin, patient number nine, could I have a sample, please, a, a biopsy or whatever it might be? But no, they don't have to. But fundamentally, they are now because they, the more of these kind of connections that go on, the more they, the sharing this information is, is making a difference, I guess, in the adrenal tumor domain. That's just a, a small subset of the kind of information we are making available. If you want, there's a much richer variety of information we've also been collecting. So if you want to know how many of these have had a particular type of surgery, that we have that one. I mean, there's all sorts of clinical vocabulary which we, we pick up. How many of them are on certain drugs, certain treatments, over how long? How is this making a difference on, to the patient? What cocktail of drugs are they getting uh, over the, the course of the treatment? What combination of chemotherapy are they getting in combination with those drugs? Um, and all a variety of information on the pathology. I mean, are, is the cancer still progressing? Is it, has it still, is it still metastasizing and spreading? And if so, is this cocktail of treatments actually working for that pa patient? And if it isn't working with that patient, should I treat my patient that way? If they have the same sort of phenotypic background, a male with the following. 
So I guess really what we're trying to do in this project is build a system which allows researchers who are interested in, not interested, but to understand which patients, how you treat them and how can you, I now screen for my new wonder drug, which I claim will kill cancer or whatever it might be. I don't want to just randomly recruit. I want to, tr I want to get those patients who either have had certain types of treatment, didn't work, or, or, or try some new approach which is different than what's already been gone, undertaken. So you can ask more richer questions on this. Um, but there's a variety, a variety of clinical trials running right now. So there's two major ones as part of the grants. And since we've started, the, the German federal government has sponsored a whole batch of new ones. But in short, from a project that started this year, we now have a major, I mean, this is globally unique, I guess you could say. There is no database with this kind of information available for researchers on, the, uh, on ad adrenal tumors, basically. It's a five-year project started this year. There's one techie who does, who does this. And that's my sort of, if you know how to do it, you can do it quickly. Um, and another thing we do, which I won't go into details about, is provide, if you like, the, the DHL map, um, um, where's my parcel service. So show, show me who, who has samples from patient number 57. Where are they now? What are you, we have to have this tracking of information and processing of information for our ethics committees who want to know where are all the samples for a given patient. So we have to have these capabilities. And what you see there is the sort of sticky labels that we print out that goes on the test tubes, that goes in the fridge. And when the pathologist gets asked for a sample for patient 57, they know which one it is basically. And we track this through the system. So as I say, this is, I like this model. It doesn't make me inherit IT systems from a hospital, I'm, although we can do this and I'll briefly cover this in the next slide, but it's, you can build a lot of software very quickly. You can build layers of security very quickly without having to go through 150 different meetings with clinical data providers and their associate committees to deploy some widget on their systems. Um, and it, as I say, it works very quickly. I'll briefly touch, because I'm, I'm running out of time, on another project which is just finished now, or just finished in the last week or so, which is doing a different model where we did go through, in this case, we, we, that model wouldn't have worked because in this case, we really needed real-time access to real-time data for patients. Um, so right. in a nutshell, we build systems which push out data from hospital settings to a central repository in real time. In this case, what we were looking at for, for patients who are in a, in a coma, effectively, we try to predict whether their blood pressure will go down above a given threshold for a given amount of time. And if that happens, it's called a hypertensive event. And if that happens, they, can, they never fully recover. And so intensivists and people who work in the ICU ward are paranoid about this. So they were perpetually monitoring, monitoring a whole range of things. And so I won't go through all the details, but effectively we asked them, what do you call hypertensive events? Every country has a different system. Every, every hospital has a different approach. We standardize what that, what sh that should be for, for this project, which all the clinicians signed up to. And we had to integrate all these different types of data. So the fact that it was a young guy who, who fell off his motorbike and was laying unconscious, or if it was an old granny who fell down the stairs, all these different kinds of in information, demographic information is important because they all get different treatments. So the young guy on a motorbike will have much more rigorous drug treatments potentially because his body can cope than your old grandma. Um, tons of different, every, every hospital we went to, there were six major ICU wards we dealt with. Completely, to say it was heterogeneous was an understatement. Different hardware, different software, different everything, you name it. Again, we had to take all these arbitrary data sets, process them, align them to a standardized model, which had been defined by, by a group, and build an IT system which then would integrate all this data and, and run Bayesian neural networks, basically, to look at the patterns in the data, which might indicate when a patient might go below that threshold, effectively. I won't go through all the details because it's just going to take too long. Well, effectively, it, we ran a major sort of clinical trial. To this, I think it was something like 60 patients from uh, six centers who were involved. And my, our role in that project was to bring all of these different data sets together for the algorithms to process and provide real-time traffic lights at the bedside warning in the next 15 seconds this patient might become hypertensive. That works, that model. You can't, if you have the goodwill of the patients, and the good, well, not the patients in this case, but the goodwill of the, the clinical data providers, you can build these applications. It's... Keeping it light touch is, is key to what we've been doing in this. It's not a case of we're going to install this stack on the IT because that it just wouldn't happen. They don't, and I wouldn't want that. 
And I won't go over the last one because it's really hard to explain, but I'm more than happy to talk about it in detail. As you can see from the algorithm, there's a lot more to this. In a nutshell, it generates queries with hashed and encrypt cryptographic solutions, which organizations can pull into their, um, you know, into their organizations. They can decrypt some of the data. They can feed some of the data out. You can link and join on the hashed values, remove how you hashed it, and you get access to the data. It's, we've been running with this system for some time in the UK and in projects in the area of mental health and, and depression and suicide, etc., where you're linking data from clinical world, with the social world, with a variety of other data sets. And the final one will back be where I can say, show me all the patients with type 2 diabetes across Australia. Queries get streamed out. They get inter intercepted by all the hospital organizations, which is like, do we allow this? Don't we allow this? If the answer is yes, then I'll get all these results coming back. I've never built that system. That system will never, if I'm really honest, I don't think that's a, a viable system to build. Because too many agendas, too many difficulties lie in the way of doing that en masse, if you like. So I, I guess I've sort of timed out. Um, I guess I, 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 most of the systems I, I've been building have gone beyond, I told you I could build a portal to a system which is now being used for fairly major clinical trials and studies for uh, involving many, many international partners, I guess. And I have a range of other projects which are now kicking off um, looking at other rare, rare diabetes related diseases, other types of cancer, other rare syndromes. And we just had a five year pro project funded by the MRC in the UK, taking some of the systems we've gone forward to allow a range of other studies. Okay, and that was me. Thank you, Richard. <coughs>